Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Mark. Um, I'm out here today, just in my Mark, garage. Um, I'm out here today, just in my garage. And what is happening? 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 My garage. There we go. Okay. So I had two brothers open there. That was weird. Anyways, this is my first YouTube live, and I just want to go over every single thing for you guys and talk about like any questions you have regarding trail building, anything you want to know basically, and I'll share my knowledge with you. So to jump right into it, I see there's a couple questions already in the side, and I'm just going to uh, answer your questions. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, BM Outdoors is asking, how should I build a small dirt jump? with no wood that just with just sticks and dirt. I mean, you kind of need, yeah. So if, if you have like no, no wood at all, like finding a spot with good dirt is really important. And if it's just a small jump, like try to find like a spot you can kind of like dig a hole with and then use that dirt from that hole to pile up. And I try to avoid like bomb pits. So you never want to have like a huge hole beside your ramp. And that's not good at all. So it's good to like either like dig the ground lower around the jump to make everything kind of dip into the ground and then use the dirt around you and just kind of like reshape your landscape. That's always better than just trying to build a bomb hole and stack it up. And if you're building a smaller jump, like it's even easier, just kind of like try to like grade the whole ground around you and then use that extra dirt to like just pile it up where the jump should be. So that's the best way I would say to do that. <laughs> hey, what's up everyone? Kyler's channel, Bevan. Schroeder private D. <laughs> hey, what's up guys? Okay, a bunch of you are asking me stuff. So I do have a list of questions from Instagram that people left me as well. So we got lots of questions to go through and I only got an hour here. So let's see what we can get through. All right, let's say Lewis is asking, hi, I would love to know how to make the sides of my jump nice and straight. Okay, and this is something I think I need to do like a video tutorial on because it's really hard to explain just from sitting in my garage being injured right now, I can't be like out on the trail teaching you guys anything. But I I feel like, imagine it just like, it's like artwork shaping jumps, right? So it takes a lot of practice, a lot of time. But the best way to like shape the edges of stuff is to like get a base pack on the jump first. And like, so like get everything hardened, get it the size you want it to be. And then kind of shave the edges steeper and shave away the access dirt later. That's the way you want to do it. And then you can like use that excess dirt, sift it, throw it on the face of things, make it even smoother. And that's the like kind of the way to do it. Honestly, like you, you almost want to have the jump done and then make it look better later rather than trying to like build it perfect as you go. That's always a little more difficult. Okay, let's see here. Um, how to make a trail that drains well. A lot of it is like choosing your location. Like, so for example, I ended up with a section of trail a few years ago that was like going through basically what was a riverbed, but I really liked the lineup for like a future uh, step down right after. So I had to like cut through there and it, it wasn't ideal, but I had to take a bunch of rock, stack it up above the riverbed zone and then put it on top. And I had to like elevate everything. So just remember you want your trail surface to be like the highest point all the time. If you want it to drain really well, like, you can have areas that dip lower, kind of like what I did on the first like proper jump on my isolation line. It's like a berm that dips down to the ground and comes up. But if you watch those like build lapses again, you'll notice that I like cut a drain out on the rider's left. So anything that like when it rains, everything washes down to the left and it doesn't, it can't cool up with like water anywhere. Um, okay, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> So many questions, guys. This is rad. I don't know if I'm even going to get to the Instagram questions that were sent to me last night. Uh, let's see here. Um, how to do rollers for big bikes on trails? I uh, would say, like, for bigger bikes, like, make everything bigger and more spaced out than you think. And I even like just learned this a few years ago when I was working on on building bigger stuff for big bikes. I was working up in Mount Washington, which is like my local bike park here, and I'd only ever built my own trails. I'd never built anything for a bike park. And I started building everything too tight and too small because I was thinking about me riding it, not like your average person who's not going to be like as dialed in a tight corner or roller on their own. And you have to like kind of build more for the general public and more for downhill bikes. So 
just like space out everything more than you think, like make it like twice as long as you think it should be. And if it's not, if it's not like flowing fast enough, then like co go from the base on the other side and just like shave it up and make it a bit taller. That's what I would say. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got here. I'm just gonna hit one question at a time. So it's gonna take a while here. Okay, biking Ben saying he can't find a good place to build trails. How do you find a good place that's open to the public? And where do you build your trails and how do you get permission? Man, this is such a tough question to answer for people who are in other countries. I mean, if you're in Canada, it's it's we're pretty lucky here, like especially where I live on Vancouver Island. Like I grew up in Victoria, BC, which is like a pretty good sized city. And growing up, like the regional district just tore down everything we rode. You couldn't be like within like a 40 minute radius of town without anything getting torn down unless you had like it on private property. And all our riding zones were on people's properties where their parents let us dig or like it was like their property and they let us go in there and build. So that was like quite rare too. And I now live two and a half hours north of there in a smaller town. And it's like everything's owned by logging companies here. And a lot of the times like our official trail networks are working with societies that work with the logging companies and they have an agreement to share the land. So that's really cool. Where I'm building right now is on crown land. So that's technically public lands, similar to like what's in Southern Utah, like around Virgin and, and that sort of area, like in the rampage zones, that's all kind of like public lands too. So there's little pockets around North America that are public lands where you kind of get like, you kind of have like the free for all to do whatever you want. And we're lucky because it's, it's private, it's crown land, but it's also first nations land and they've given permission for trails to be in that zone. So I talked to one of the people who started the trail network near my trail and I kind of just got confirmation that it was okay for me to build in there. And yeah, I got really lucky because like it's kind of, I kind of have free reign to do whatever I want, but it is a 40 minute drive every morning. So like from my house here, it takes me 40 minutes to get out there. It's a bit of a mission. So if I wasn't like, if I didn't have a car, if I wasn't driving, it's a lot harder. So. When you're younger, it's definitely harder. And I would say just find little areas you can build dirt jumps in or things like that. And they kind of don't expect something to last a long time, unfortunately, unless you have like a really dialed location. That's kind of just the way it is. Um, let's see what else. <laughs> Milo saying, I, bis I missed one of the best trails in Smithers. I know that's probably, oh yeah, pay dirt. Yeah, I heard about that one. It sucks. Like we were there and I never got to ride a lot of the stuff because we were there for like a campaign with the BC Ale Trail. And we were going from like one city to the other. So we literally went from like Smithers to like Prince George the next day. And we only had one day in Smithers. And we had one guy who showed us everything in like half half a day. So there's so much sick stuff up there. I got to see still. I'm so pumped. Yo, what up, Alex? Uh, we're all injured a little. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. Am I sponsored by Hydro Flask? Yes, I am. I'm wearing like all Hydro Flask right now. I just realized. Um, okay. Um, what else we got here for questions? We got so many. What are the best trail building tools? I would say like all the basics. So like a flathead shovel, a spade shovel, a rake. And then I got this like really cool pickaxe. It's really like got a big head and it's like kind of like a medic on one side and almost like a mini shovel on the other. And I use that for like carving out trail but there's another brand called rogue tools like r-o-u-g-u-e rogue and i have like one of their like fire picks and it's so sweet for trail building so definitely would check them out i gotta get them to sponsor me <laughs> that would be the dream because they make really nice expensive stuff and one of the local bike shops in town here sells their tools so that's where i get them from and that's like all the basics so shovel pick flathead um, regular spade and shovel and then like a nice rake. And if you can get a fire rake too, like that's great too for really raking out wider stuff. Um, what bike do I have? I'm running a few bikes. So I got the Marin Hawk Hill back there behind me. And then I building up my Alpine trails like built now. It's pretty much done. If you take a look at all my bikes over here, there's that Alcatraz Alpine trail. I'm going to do a bike check on the Alpine trail really soon. As soon as I can go for a ride with it, I'll do a video where I'm like, riding it on its first ride and uh finally back on the bike can't wait i'm still kind of sore but i can like get full range now so i'm hoping within two weeks i'll be biking again okay let's see here what else we got 
look at all these questions. I'm trying to like catch up with you guys here. <laughs> Gonna make my screen a bit bigger. Um, Let's see. Are you allowed to go to a public bike park and fix the jumps? Because my local trails are super neglected and worn down. Yeah. I mean, everywhere is different. So we got like the dirt jumps here in town in Cumberland, BC, which is a public bike park and you're allowed to work on them. They leave the hose out, but they lock the tools. They only leave the tools for certain people just because they don't want to risk all the tools getting stolen. But I mean, you can still go in there with your own tools and work on them. And they're, they're pretty relaxed. Whereas another bike park I helped start called the North Sandwich Freeride Park down in Victoria, BC, that one, like they have to be organized build days or they're not going to let you work on the bike park. So it really depends where you are. Everywhere is different. Some places are more relaxed. I'm really lucky where I live now is so relaxed. It's more of a small town, more secluded and lots of free space everywhere. Like it's kind of the reason I moved up here. I miss the city, but it, at the same time, I get so much freedom up here for trail building and riding and all that stuff. Okay, how close should turns be in small trails? Uh, man, that's a really tough question to answer because it really depends on like what you're trying to build in the first place. And so much of like spacing and like learning the right spacing on stuff is trial and error. So, I mean, I know it doesn't sound that helpful, but honestly, like build something, ride it, and then you'll know right away if it works or not. And then like over time, you're going to figure out what works best and you're like for me now i can like look at a section of the forest i can start cutting a trail and it always ends up different than i plan it on looking so like even the line i just finished or i haven't finished i'm only about halfway down the hill actually there's gonna be a lot more building after the stump gap but what i've gotten done so far is huge a huge huge difference from what was going on in my mind in the first place like what i had in mind was way tighter uh smaller jumps and I just kind of like pictured it differently and then it worked out a completely different way for the, for the better, but there's no like magic answer. It's not like, Oh, always go three feet between two corners. Like that's not the answer. It really depends on your landscape, on your riding style and what's going to be the smoothest, like for that land you're working with. So just like build what looks right, try riding it before you like really do the final touches and then you'll start figuring out pretty quickly how far apart things should be. It's uh, definitely like, there's definitely like an art to it. There's no like, it's not, it's like an art, not a science. Like there's no equation that's gonna give you that, that answer. Okay, let's see here. Huh. How should I build a trickable table? I mean, unless you have a machine, I wouldn't recommend. Also keep like, and asking the same question over and over if I missed it, because there's a lot of questions going through here and and I'm not gonna see them all. So if you really want your question answered and I missed it, just like keep asking and I'll, I'll probably see it. Okay, so how should I build a trickable table? Um, I would say like just build, I've only built gap jumps. Like I honestly have never built a tabletop. So if you don't have an excavator, it's a lot more work. Cause like to build a tabletop, you need a ton of dirt. So I would recommend like, just build a gap at first. I mean, it depends what you're building. Like, I mean, I would say like build a gap that's small enough that you can like be comfortable on and then make it bigger and more trickable by making it steeper. That's probably like the, maybe the best way to do it because like having a nice radius on a takeoff makes something very trickable. And I would say like, it's hard to measure everything up when you're building, but in general, like just like a very, very general dimension for, for like curves on ramps if your radius is double the length of your height that's like a good start so say you're building like i i guess not your height but not double the length but i mean if it's i'm thinking of like a six foot tall jump because that's like the average size lip that most people that build my style trail build is around six feet tall so double would be a 12 foot radius and that's like kind of on the tight side so like a 12 foot radius or longer like let's say 12 to 14 feet, that's a good radius for a trickable jump. Whether it's three feet tall, six feet tall, 10 feet tall, no matter how big you go, that's a good radius for the most part. But a lot of BMXers recommend like 10 to 12 feet. So for mountain biking, just go a bit longer. Okay, do you have an Alcatraz? Yeah, I have that bike. That's like one of my favorites. Um, I just, I've been riding it around, just like cruising around the street lately, trying to feel better on the bike and start riding again soon. 
Yeah, super sick bike. Uh, have you ever ridden BMX? That's actually how I started off with bike riding is I had a like a little, what was it? Oh yeah, my dad found someone that had like a backyard skate park set up and they had this little like wooden box jump they had to get rid of. So he like picked it up for me and we had it sitting at the house. And my first bike was like an old specialized BMX. And I just remember like hitting that little table box jump thing. It was like maybe five feet long like all day I was so pumped and then I started building dirt jumps and that's kind of how I started with bike riding was just like dirt jumping on a BMX for a couple of years before I even got into mountain biking. So yeah. How am I injured? Broken collarbone. Okay. Let's see here. How should I make a trail where the trees are close together? Okay. So it really depends. I saw someone ask me about sanction trails too. So I'm going to kind of answer this as a, as a two part question. So, I mean, when I'm in an area with really tight trees, I try to avoid areas with tight trees because I like really fast, like flowy stuff. So I'll like pick more open sections of forest to build through. But when it's tighter, like I really like, like just kind of building like straighter fall line sections of trail where you can navigate through the trees easier and then have like catcher berms. Say like you have a more of a little bit of an open section in a tight forest, just bomb straight through it, go really fast. And then where the trees get tighter, if you can somehow navigate around them, by building like a catcher berm or something like that, it's going to direct you away from the trees. That's the way to do it. And I mean, if there's lots of trees, if you want to still make it flow well, you can build up taller corners if you have the nice dirt. It does get tricky though, because like the more trees you have, the more roots you hit. And I tend to like not want to like cut up a ton of roots and it's a lot of work. So, <laughs> I mean, I like if there is too many trees and they're small trees, I'll, I'll just cut them out with a chainsaw. But it, that is like also something I wouldn't recommend doing unless you have like permission to do so or you're in a really safe space for that. Because I mean, that's highly illegal in a lot of parts of the world. I mean, here it's easy to get away with if you're on the right plot of land where I live, but a lot of places it's not. And that comes back to another question about sanctioned trails. Someone was asking, do I build in sanctioned trails? The area I'm currently building now is not sanctioned and they're working on it. So there's a little bit of freedom because it's kind of a gray area. Like I know I can get away with building without like it being an illegal activity, but it, nothing's like official yet. So I know that like, I pretty much know that I'm safe, but there's a lot of areas where people build like in pretty illegal spots and a lot of mountain bike trails happen that way. And uh, yeah, I, I would recommend Go sanctioned if you can, especially if you live closer to a city or you're not like in a place like BC where it's kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> it's kind of a gray area up here. Like there's so much crown land and other like forestry lands that we can get away with a lot of trail building that's technically illegal, but there's not really a consequence to it. Have I rode in Port Angeles? Yes, I've been there before. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. I went to Dry Hill once. I grew up in Victoria, so it's just the short ferry across the water. And I've never gone there for the race, but I've been over there once and rode some of the stuff on Dry Hill, and it's pretty sick. Um, what's your opinion on rollers? I love rollers. I love how they can add flow and speed to flat sections of trail. Like, for example, right now, right after the stump gap, it's pretty flat for a couple hundred meters before the hill dips down again, and I got really nice grade for the rest of it. But... I need to figure out how am I gonna how am I gonna navigate across that flat space. So my initial thoughts right now are I'm gonna steepen the jump so I go higher over the stump, build the landing out and up a bit and steeper. And then I'm gonna like cut into the, that flat section of ground. There's no trees really around me because it's like pretty open. There's a road there. So I'm gonna like, I think I'm gonna navigate across a big part of that flat section by like building a hip jump or something right away. And then I'll I'll do a couple of rollers to really give me momentum. And that's the best part about rollers is they can help you gain a lot of speed if you um if you uh, want to like just like not get through that bit of trail and it's really hard to keep going. Okay, next uh, next question. I'm gonna stick to the trail building related questions, but Grant is asking if I knew Jordy Lunn, and yes, I did. We were actually roommates for almost two years, and he was one of my best friends. So it's it's definitely been tough. Like even like last night, I was having a bit of a hard time like just thinking about it I was like wow I can't believe he's gone because he was such like a strong personality and like really influential person in my life and yeah so much life to him so it's, it's a very surreal feeling 
when you lose someone that close to you and like someone who's that unique of a personality, like it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, okay. Back to the troubling questions. <laughs> um, would you like to build a medium trick? I would like, so golden wolf is asking, he wants to build a medium sized trick jump with a wooden takeoff and a mulch landing where he can learn tricks. Um, what size would you recommend for jump bikes and full suspension? Okay. So, I mean, that medium is subjective. I guess it depends how big you want to go, but I've always thought like a six foot tall ramp, 12 foot, 12 foot gap is a nice size. It's kind of just big enough to do like big, to start learning bigger tricks on like backflips and three sixties with like a comfortable amount of airtime. That's not too small, but it's not like overly huge. And you're not going to like get like, you're not going to risk a major injury if you crash on something that size. So I would say a six foot ramp, maybe make the radius like 12 to 14 feet long, maybe a bit on the longer side. If you're on a, if people are going to hit it on a downhill bike. And then, yeah, make it a bit of a step up. So make the mulch landing like a foot taller or two and nice and long and mellow. And I would say, yeah, that's a good size to go with. A little smaller if that seems intimidating when you start shaping up the curves. And that's about the size of the mulch jump at the Stevie Smith Park in Nanaimo. So anyone who's been there who knows what I'm talking about for the local, thank you, Ryland Riders. That's about the size of that jump. And I see a lot of people learning flips and 360s and other bigger tricks on it. But they are like... It's a little small for some combination tricks, like they can be done, but it's a little small, but that's like the perfect size for learning. So I would say six foot takeoff, 12 foot gap, make the radius 12 to 14 feet. That's probably a great size. Okay, here, um, I'm from Germany and we can't build anywhere where I live and no real trails in the city even put in. nail boards on the landings. Oh man, that sucks. And that's kind of what it was like in Victoria, BC, where I grew up. Like. There's the organization called the CRD, like the Capital Regional District. And even some of the sick riding areas now, like they allow the trails to still be there, but you can't actually work on them. And it's like very backwards thinking for like such a strong mountain bike, like hub in the world and the culture we have here. So, I mean, that's always a bummer in that situation. All I can recommend is like try to work in smaller areas, just like little jump parks and areas like that. And until you're old enough to move away <laughs> and move somewhere with more land, kind of like what I did, then you can get a bit more freedom to get out there and build whatever. Okay, um, what are your key elements to a perfect downhill trail? Oh man, again, that really depends on the landscape you're in. But I mean, if I'm looking at a downhill trail, I'm probably gonna pick somewhere that's like a little rockier and steeper than where I'm in now. So the line I'm building now is, a for. I had this bike in mind. So I had the Hawk Hill in mind, like 120 mil trail bike that I can just like do jumps on and it's nice and smooth and fast. And it's not going to be too rough on a smaller bike like that. But for a downhill trail, I want to work with a little more rough natural terrain. So I would go somewhere like that has more steep rock faces and a little more rock, but still some good dirt because I like to have a mix of like jumps and flow and tech. So if you can like mix that together and have like a bit of everything, I would say var variety is the answer to that. Like the sh in short, Variety makes the perfect downhill trail, like fast tech, fast berms, jumps, and cool stuff like that. Like a bit of everything. That's what I love. Um, Lewis is asking, how do you um, dig deep holes in the ground with a with hard pack ground? What tools should I use and how? That's really where the pickaxe comes in handy. Like if it's really hard packed dirt, just use the sharp end of that and just keep picking at it. And there's a couple really cool shovels you, you can get makes me wish like I went into my trail before this live and grabbed some stuff so I could show you on camera, but I don't have like any of my tools in my garage right now, but you can like look for like those really sharp shovel spades that have like a good foot pad on them. The, the ones that are like full on fiberglass handles. There's some really good stuff out there and you want to like spend more money on tools, like definitely get the $50 shovel, not the $20 shovel. I know it's more money, but it's going to, in the long run, be way, it's going to save you a lot of time when you're building. Um, lots of questions about permission. So I might come back to that again. I've already answered that a few times. Um, same with drainage. What sort of bark wood chip should you use for mulch landing? Uh, this is a, okay, so 
when I built my first mulch jump, how I built it was I ended up buying a bunch of haystacks to like build up the lining. So it was the easiest, it, like, it rots, but it's just going to kind of break down into like soft dirt anyway. So I built a bunch, I bought a bunch of haystacks, like boxed in a landing. And then I hit up a bunch of local arborists and I just got um, them to bring me their wood chips. And it was a little rougher, but it was free. So I hit up a bunch of local arborists and then I got all this like free kind of rough stuff that you wouldn't want to land in. But I got that to fill in like half of the half of the hollow landing of the haystacks. And then I went to some like local places that you get dirt and gravel from. And I found out what and wood chips from. And I, I asked for like the thinnest stuff. Like you don't want too thin. You don't want the stuff that's going to get you like really itchy. But you want to get like kind of in between like an inch or two size chip and get a bunch of chips that size and then top everything off with that. And if you can mix it with a bit of sand too, I think that's nice because I don't like landing in pure sand. It really gets stuck in your bike and mulch is itchy. So if you can like kind of blend and mix together, that's going to also help a little bit and, and give you like kind of the ideal amount. But honestly, none of that stuff's ideal to land in, but it's softer than a dirt jump and it's a good way to learn. Let's see here. What else? Um, How do you make drainage for berms? Man, this is a tough one too. So for berms, like if you're building a pump track on a flat space, I find like a lot of the times you have to build the berm and then cut like a hole through the middle of it later, put a drainage pipe in and then patch that part of the berm up. But that's like if you're on flat ground, that's what I'll do. And then I kind of like in the middle of the pump track in the low spots, I'll, I'll dig them even lower. So I know the water drains there and then the pipes will direct everything to the outside. So the pump track won't pull up. That's kind of the most technical type of drainage. And then when you're on like a downhill, it's really easy because you just have to like make sure the lowest point of the trail is the bottom side of the berm. And then if you're like doing an S berm where it's all going to drain to the next corner, then that's the same thing. So like you're coming through the corner, the low side's going to be here, make sure it drains out that way. And then if the next berm is coming directly into that drainage then try to cut the start of that berm down, like, try to like bank the ground down lower right below that berm. And then just like, think of like almost like a snake run of drainage that directs you away from like the top sides of the corners, the whole way down the trail. That's kind of what you've got to keep in mind. And it's not actually that hard because if you're working with a downhill space, like it's always kind of going to drain for you and you're not gonna have to worry too much. How wide should you make single track? That is another good question. And I mean, it's really up to you. Like my trailing building now is a little wider than most single track trails just because of all the jumps I have. I like to have my jumps like three feet wide or so. So the single track ends up around that wide, but it depends on the landscape. So if you're working with like really smooth ground, you can keep single track nice and narrow. But if you want it a little quicker, like it also depends how, how fast you want the trail to run. So the wider you make it, the faster the trail is going to get, but you don't want it too wide. So. Yeah, I would say just like cut it out like that wide, like a foot or two with the pickaxe if you're just trying to go for like natural terrain flow without features. And then the more people that ride it, the wider it's going to get naturally too. And if it starts rutting out and it feels too narrow, like it's going to like like scrape pedals or something, then come back in with the pickaxe and widen it even more. But yeah, I never really worry too much about it. I just make it as wide as it looks like it should be for the land I'm working with. Uh, Lewis is asking, should he invest in an electric chainsaw to help him cut up wood? Uh, that'd be pretty cool. I've always thought about that too, because it's a lot quieter, but where I'm working right now is like a totally cool place to use a chainsaw. No one's gonna care. And uh, I mean, gas chainsaws are cheaper. They're more powerful. And I feel like you get a lot like you bring a you bring some bar oil and a little tank of gas with you and you're good all day long whereas the electric saw is going to eventually die so i think a gas saw is the way to go honestly but electric saws are getting better and they're pretty cool to have so there's that okay um 
I'm going to answer a couple. I'm going to take a break on a couple of your guys' questions because there's a few people who asked me in here who, let's see here, asked me some of the same, some questions I haven't answered yet because I'm getting a lot of the same ones on the live. I'm thinking of like the most common theme that has been asked so far in these comes back to like shaping. So many people are wondering about how to shape jumps. And I've gotten like so many of these questions even in here. And it's really making me think about this because I've been like thinking about this, how to answer this while I'm answering your other questions. And shaping is a really tough one to teach. And I, I'm really gonna do, I'm gonna, that's one of the first things I'm gonna do a video on when I'm healed. I think I'm gonna reshape the stump gap completely because I, I want to get everything shaped up differently for the flow of the trail anyways. So my like first next video on trail building is going to be reshaping the stump gap and getting the run out ready for the next feature. And I'm going to like make it kind of a tutorial all about how to shape because like not only do you have to think about certain angles and everything, but the technique that's involved is pretty like pretty challenging. Like the way you like shape and scrape, and like slap pack jumps and get everything really smooth and get it the shape it needs to be for the purpose it's being used for. It's such a long answer. Like I could honestly describe it for an hour long. So hold your thought on that one. Everyone who's wondering about how to shape jumps, just stay tuned for that episode because I'm really going to go into detail with that. I'll make it a nice long episode and I think you'll find it really helpful. Okay. Let's back into the questions now. <laughs> Okay, so how do you measure the radius of the of a dirt jump? Okay, so that's a good question. So the radius is basically the length of the curve itself. So take, for example, um, a string. Say you take a string and you basically make the string the length you want the radius to be. So say you're building a, a jump. I mean, it's harder to dirt jump. I've never actually measured the radius of a, of a dirt to dirt jump. Whoa, that's, that's weird. This one's calling me, it's coming through on my my phone. Okay, we're back. Okay, so um, I've never actually measured the radius of a dirt jump. I've always just kind of built everything and then eyeballed it and like reshaped the dirt based on based on looking at it. But the way you measure a radius in general is take a string and whatever length the string is, is the radius of the jump. So let's say the string is 12 feet long and then you walk, you tie it to something and then you walk with it so the string is tight and then you like, draw a line, say you like put a pencil at the end of the string and then you walk to what you walk to the length of the string and then you just put it on the ground, measured it out. The curve that it's creating is like what you're gonna get with that radius. So it's a 12 foot string, that curve it's gonna give you is a 12 foot radius. And that's kind of how it works. And there's some good tutorial videos out there on YouTube. Like I did one in the episode, I forget which episode it was of isolation when I tried building that wood curve for the first time. I made like an 18 foot radius, which was too mellow for the stump gap. So I'm gonna save that curve for something else, but you can see exactly how I measured out the radius. And that's how I did it. Sam Pilgrim has a good tutorial here too. If you just like Google dirt jump radius um, or like ramp radius, he'll show you how he did it. But with actual dirt jumps, like you kind of just gotta eyeball it and go by hand. Okay, um, I'm gonna answer the brim question in one second, but so far I'm getting a few questions about how to get sponsored. And I actually did two lives a few months ago, like two separate lives on how to get sponsored. And I spent about a week straight just like writing out some like pieces of advice on like how to work on practicing your riding. I even put some trail building tips in there. And I did put in like how you get sponsored, how to approach bike companies, and um, all the things you need to do, not only to work on your riding, but to work on your rider portfolio, how to build up your social media, how to make your content better. Basically all those things you're wondering about, um, I, I put in a folder on Bubble Up, which is what I use to get people interested in this workshop as well. It's cool, it's kind of like Dropbox, but you can like have people add stuff for you. So I'm gonna, here's a link to it right here. I just put in the comments, if anyone wants to join that folder, it has everything you need to know about how to get sponsored. So you might find that helpful. So that'll answer all the questions about sponsorship that are coming through. 
Um, let's see, a couple questions on how to shape berms. Berms are tough too. Like I would say like what you should do when you build a berm, because I know it can be confusing to like really figure out what the curve should be. I would say like mark out your start points, like where you want to enter a corner and where you want to exit a corner. That's going to really help you clearly visualize it because like that's going to really help you like look at how you want your trail to go and how you imagine your trail flowing is really going to help you shape your brand because it's basically just an extension of how the trail's going. And I'm always amazed every time I build a brand on how quick it goes because you're working with the natural land so fast. So for example, I got my starting point, I got my ending point, and I'll just take like my pickaxe or my shovel or something and I'll drag it. I'll just like drag a line from one point to the other and I won't like cut it deep too deep. I'll just like draw a line. I'll look at how that looks. I'll imagine myself riding through it. And if the corner looks a little too shallow, then I'll kind of cut it through a bit more. But I mean, the land's really going to read the situation for you and really defining your start and finish is going to help you with, with all that. Okay. So that's like the basics of shaping the, like the radius of the berm. And then to get the rest of it done, you want to dig into the ground and then stack up. So if you're in an area like I am right now where I'm super lucky and I can just like cut into the ground, it makes it so easy because I just like cut down, take all that dirt, throw it up, and then it's going to make everything tall really fast because half the corner will be underground, the other half will be stacked up. Before you know it, you'll have a waist high corner. So that's pretty cool. Another thing too is like if you don't have a lot of dirt to work with, you can shape up a brim with rocks. So I saw my buddy, Scott Thornhill, who's like an epic trail builder. He did some stuff in Mount Washington, which is my local bike park. I'm actually going to pull it up on, on Facebook, just on my phone for you guys right now. I think that's where he posted. He didn't even put it on, didn't even put it on, on Instagram, but this is crazy. Maybe he did. I'm going to go on Instagram. It'll be way quicker to find. He basically built up a berm with rocks and it was the most insane thing I've ever seen. I don't know how they did it so well. Is it even in here? Oh yeah, here it is. Here's a sequence of it. So it starts off like they just built a fence up because there was a cliff right there. And then they eventually stacked that much rock to get it up there. It's so crazy. And that was sick. I wouldn't recommend building that way if you don't have to. But I mean, if you're only working with rock, it can just take a lot more time and it can be done and it's badass. So there's that. All right. What else you got for questions? How do you get water into your building location? Okay. So for me, like I typically don't build in the summer because it's too dry. And I live in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia. And we're super lucky because basically from like October to June, we can build without it being too dry. It's a huge, huge window. And in the middle of the summer, I typically just go riding. So this is honestly something I haven't really had to think too much about, but there is dirt jump zones we have, like dirt jump spots where they are ridden most often in the summer and that's when they're most likely to crumble. And dirt jumps are such steep, smooth angles that unlike your typical mountain bike trail, you really have to ma manicure them and keep them like really perfect. And what we do is like, we have some like big water buckets, like just imagine some like old big oil jugs and we store a few of them in the forest and there's a river nearby and we'll just do like loads with buckets and we'll like, get those big like huge drums full of water and we'll have kind of like little spots to get water from. But if you can like find a, like a river or something to build near, that's like super, that's super good if it's possible. But if you're like in a desert, like if you're someone who's building in like a really dry province or state and like, there's no water sources nearby. Like I honestly don't know the answer to that. Cause I've never had to deal with that before. Um, Okay, well, how should you go about building jumps out of snow? <laughs> I've never su successfully done that, so I, I couldn't answer that for you. Like, we don't really get a lot of snow here either, so when it does snow, I just go snowboarding. <laughs> um, uh, let's see what else we got for questions. Can I learn to jump on skateboard ramps? Um, I mean, you can go to the skate park and, like, Riding something like a half pipe is a really cool way to like really learn how to ride transitions and steeper takeoffs. I mean, if anyone, anyone who's ever asked me like, Hey, how do you, how do you ride a really steep jump? Like I can't figure it out. Cause I know a lot of mountain bikers struggle with it, especially 
now like mountain biking is a growing sport. I feel like a lot of people are getting into the sport in their twenties and thirties and they don't have that basic skill they learned in their teens on riding steeper ramps. So if you have no idea how to ride a steep ramp, go to a skate park and try riding up and down a half pipe and try learning how to air a half half pipe because it's super challenging and you're quickly going to figure out how to shift your body weight around in a way that's going to teach you steeper jumps. Yo, BM Outdoors is asking for a shout out. So you get one because you've been asking me a ton of questions so far. So I really appreciate that. So thanks, BM Outdoors. Um, Ethan's asking, how do you get over the fear of gaps? Um, I did a video on this um, a few months ago. So go back there and watch my video all about fear. That's going to help you. I'm going to keep everything here sticking to the trail building theme because we only have 20 minutes left before I have to go. Okay, let's get back to the Back to subject on trail building. Fabio saying big ups on the isolation series. Thanks so much, man. I'm stoked you're liking everything so much. Um, do you think anyone can be a pro? Okay, so there's a lot of questions about um, sponsorship again and all that stuff. Thanks, thanks guys, but I'll, I'm going to stick to the trail building theme here. Um, what do you do when you have to deal with rocky ground? So there's one zone. I've been kind of helping my buddy Chris Snodgrass out lately. He's asking me to come later today. So I might go out there and just walk around and hang out because I can't really build. But he's working in a rockier area. And it's a really cool zone because there's like really nice rock faces all over the place. And there's like really challenging terrain. But there's also like there's still really nice dirt though. And the thing is like you go into like kind of the flatter sections of the hill off the trail near the trees and if you dig around the trees there's like pockets of really nice red soil so we do bucket loads of dirt so what we'll do is like even if we have to walk a little ways off the trail we'll like take a couple of those home depot buckets and we'll just like fill them up and we'll we'll get dirt where we need need to put it but it's not like my isolation zone at all it's not that same style of trail building you're mostly like doing 100 percent natural build trail building you're not modifying the land too much and you're getting dirt from little pockets in the forest and we'll like take as much rock as we can to stack something up and get the general shape of it. And then we'll put like a foot or two layer of dirt on top of that and we'll, and we'll layer it up. And yeah, I'll do more videos like that in the future when I'm done at this zone, working with more challenging terrain. Cause I think it, a lot of people work with rockier terrain than I do and it's tough and you've got to get a little more creative. Um, what else we got for questions here? Let's see. Another tool question. I answered that right at the very start. So I'm going to answer that a second time for those of you who jumped in later. So all the basics. So a spade, like a really good spade shovel that's sharp and has like a solid footing. And then a nice flathead. That's what you're going to use for shaping. So a really nice flathead shovel. Um, your classic rake and then a fire rake if you can, because fire rakes are awesome. They can really help you cut through the ground. And then my favorite tool right now is like a, a pickaxe, mattock slash like giant. This guy, they got a giant mattock shovel head on one side and a sharp pickaxe on the other side. So that's a really good tool to have. And then there's a company called Rogue Tools. I'm going to plug them, even though I'm not sponsored by them or everything, because they're really rad. There's a local bike shop in town here that sells Rogue Tools. And their stuff is so sweet. Like, it's like these really good trail building hose. So if you go to their website, rogueco.com, um, there you go, some free advertising for Rogueco because their stuff's expensive. I only have one of their tools because it cost me like $80, but it's so sweet. So if you like scan through their website, they have like, let's see which one it's called anyway. I think it's just like, they have one actually that's called the trail building hoe. Or no, they don't, but they have like a six inch hoe and a seven inch Highlander hoe. Oh, that, that, products on backwater right now but the seven inch highlander hoe like that's what i need to get that thing would be so sweet for trail building so like a really nice sharp hoe that would be awesome um and those are all of the tools that i think are the best for trail building um someone says we need to get seth's Seth bike hacks out here to come ride my trails that'd be sweet i'd love to see him up for the challenge and like i'm sure there's a lot of technical stuff he could teach me on trail building because like although he's not at the same level of me as riding like He's very good technically, he's a lot of stuff. So that'd be pretty cool to learn from him. Um, how would you build a rule and if you could? Oh man, that's something I never had the challenge of doing. 
But my buddy Cole, who's down in Victoria, he built like a 20 foot tall plus Roland. So I should go there soon once I can ride and do a video about, he can tell me a story about how he built that because he already did that once when I was down there. He like walked me through his Roland and it was so cool. Like he had like the story of like going out with plywood at night after work and just like with lights and framing everything up and ha hauling up the plywood. It'd be such a cool video. Okay, you got me thinking. I'm going to write down a note right now. Do a rolling video with Cole because I need to learn that myself. I'm not that good at that yet, so I can't give you the right answer. <laughs> All right. Um, do you use um, logs as a retaining wall slash film material for burns? Is it not worth it because they rot? I mean, if you have no dirt to work with, you can use wood. And that's exactly how I built the stump gap takeoff, just because I wanted to build it fast for the purpose of this video series. I know it was taking a lot longer than people wanted because I was only building like two, three times a week. I wasn't out there every single day. I have a busy schedule and there's other stuff I was doing, but it's gonna save you time. But yeah, it will rot eventually. So, I mean, for like a one-off stunt, like the stump gap, it kind of makes sense. And I can like, I can reinforce it later when things do start to rot and I have a really solid base now. But burns will like really fall apart fast with what I'm feeling like after a couple of years. So if you want your burn to be like bomb proof and last forever, just use it with dirt and do it properly the first time. But you can use some film material if you need to. Like the, the big burn going into my stump gap, I do have like, it's a pretty rotten stump, but it's from a big old tree. It's like a, like I can't even reach my arms around it. It's so big. But a couple of us were able to drag it and set it up against a existing living tree and that's a solid base that's not going to rot fast and it saved us a lot of dirt but i would say use rocks like rocks and dirt are the way to go for corners um okay do you use machines like mini diggers or rotary hose um i mean i don't have any of that equipment myself right now and i mean a lot of the spots i'm going into machines kind of are a problem like it's funny the way land permission works here. Like I can go in and build stuff by the hand, keep it low key. And it's kind of like do it first and then ask for permission later, like ask for forgiveness. That's kind of how it works here. Cause trail building is such a gray area on our crown lands and on our forestry lands. And I mean, mountain bike culture is so strong where I live that you can't really get in trouble for building as long as you're like hand building. But if you go in there with machines and then that's getting a bit heaty. So I've never done that. If I was working on my own private property, I would probably invest in something like a mini digger and I would save myself a lot of time. But at the same time, I also love the look of a hand-built trail. It just has like that really clean look. Like, don't you guys agree? Like a hand-built trail is so cool. And like, even though it takes longer, I feel like it's more of a, an art piece in a way than just a hand-built trail you've punched out. But with that being said, I like the dream is to have my own piece of land one day where I can build with <laughs> excavators, some, like some mini excavators. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. I should do more live videos. Oh yeah, good call. I'll definitely do more of these if you guys really love them. Um, have I rode in Puerto Rico? Never been there, but I'd love to go. Steam with the Faroe Islands. Like I've been to Iceland and I know the Faroe Islands are like in that same kind of part of the world and it's super cool terrain in Iceland. So I'm sure Faroe Islands is similar, even though it's a way smaller place. I'd love to check that place out. Um, any other good YouTubers for trail building? Yeah, Seth's bike hacks is pretty cool. I mean, honestly, one of my bigger inspirations is Matt Jones because he's my teammate and he's a really cool guy. And I mean, he's honestly one of the guys who inspired me to YouTube, um, like just like meet, meeting him and actually hanging out with him last summer in Whistler, like seeing what he was doing with YouTube was so cool. And then once lockdown started happening here at the start of COVID, I knew I wanted to work on another trail and I was already like YouTubing my trail builds, but I wasn't like documenting it like the way I'm now. And like just seeing what Matt started doing with his property, with his lockdown videos, I was like, okay, I gotta, I got this spot. I gotta do the same thing as him. And I, like he was a big inspiration for me for sure with the trail building stuff, like in just the way I'm documenting it on YouTube here. Um, okay. What else? It's gnarly in Puerto Rico. Hey, yeah, I got to check that out. <laughs> Eventually, once all this COVID stuff is over and we're traveling again. 
I definitely, there's so many spots I want to hit, but I, I know a lot of you didn't follow me like prior to COVID. Um, but like a lot of my content, once this is all over, is going to be travel based. So I'm not going to be just trail building. I'm going to be like going all over the world, riding new spots. Um, other people are recommending skills with Phil. I'm sure he's good for trail building content. I know of skills with Phil, but honestly, there's a lot of YouTubers that I don't even watch. I don't spend a lot of time on here. I just spend most of my time posting, honestly. Um, I just love the process of creating more so than like consuming the content on here. Um, Cole's asking, what are some underrated, underrated riding areas on the island? Oh man, I would say Nanaimo. Like, think about how many people ride in the Cowichan Valley, like around Duncan, like Suhail and Prevost, Maple Mountain even. And then they'll like go ride Cumberland and this area that I live in, I'm in the Comox Valley. And Nanaimo is sick, like Dumont and Benson and not many people will ride it. And same with like even Parksville, so, like Parksville so super underrated. There's some hidden gems that Darren Bearcloth has built around here that a lot, it's a lot of stuff that's off trail forks, but yeah, there's, there's good stuff out here that people don't really know about. So I would say like central Island is the most underrated part of, of the Island. Um, someone's asking if I'm sponsored by Marin. Yes, I am. I'm on the Marin team. I, this is my third year on them. It's been so sick, such a cool brand to ride for. And yeah, it's been sweet. Like we have a really cool, unique mix of riders on here. Oh yeah, roots. A lot of people are asking what a cool way is to work around roots, chop them out or get them out of the way. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to like, even though we used a lot of trees for that stump gap, we used mostly deadfall. Like I didn't cut down many fresh trees and the trees I did cut down, you would consider like danger trees so they were posing a danger to other trail users. So they were really close to an existing trail kind of starting to fall already. So we got them out of the way. We made the trail safer for the riders. And then we chopped them up into four foot wide rounds for the takeoff. But um, roots, I like that. They, those are what keep trees alive. So I don't like to chop them down if I don't have to. I like to save them. If you guys go and check out Darren Bearcloth's YouTube channel, he did a really cool video this week on um, roots. He, uh, he has like a little sawzall and he, he uses them to uh, cut trails, like cut smaller roots out of the trail. So I'm gonna share that link with you guys right now. Cause I thought that was a cool idea. Like Darren's always got some really unique ideas. Like he even brought like a little mini, like nail, like portable nail gun in to do slats on a jump once. So check that video out if you're wondering about a way to cut out roots. I thought it was really unique and really like smart because you can save your chainsaw from, from getting like messed up. So that was rad. Darren's always got good ideas. And I try to work around roots. Like there was this massive root on the second jump of my isolation line that I wanted to get out because then I was able, I could have made the transitions deeper and dipped everything nicer. But I decided around it because it was going to be like a lot of work digging. It would have been a big chainsaw job and it would have probably killed the tree right beside it. So what I did is I just dug up more big boulders. I stacked everything around the roots and filled it over top. But honestly, like don't make stuff too smooth if you don't need to. That's why we have mountain bikes. <laughs> you know, it's why we have suspension. Keep stuff rough if you have to within reason. Like if it's, if it's not going to kill the flow of the trail completely or like if it's only going to make stuff a little more difficult to ride, I mean, just keep the roots in there. They're good. Um, is there any shops to hire Marin bikes in BC? Um, and if, if you're asking about Marin dealers, I mean, there's Dodge City Cycles in Cumberland. There's Aerosmith Cycles in, B in uh, Parksville. And then I think Victoria's got a couple of Marin dealers. So they're... There's quite a few around me. <laughs> I just built a penis jump. <laughs> okay, I think you're gonna have to share a link with us in the comments and show us what that looks like if you're if you're not making that up. <laughs> um, okay, what else we got for questions here? We're getting close. We only have like six minutes left and I gotta get going. So I'm gonna go, go out, walk around some stuff today and finally get out there back on the trails even though I can't really ride. Um, Another question, someone is asking, what do you do if you don't have good dirt? Mine is sometimes like clay and sometimes filled with leaf parts, etc. I mean, so yeah, I don't know 
what part of the world you're in. I mean, I'm trying to think of places I've been that are not like here at all. Cause honestly, like I've traveled all over the place and we're really lucky you're here with our dirt, but somewhere like New Zealand, very high in clay content doesn't drain as well. But if you can, I would say like, if you don't have a lot of good dirt, try to, you, you're probably going to either have rock or sand and Luigi like sand and clay go hand in hand. Like if you're working somewhere that has a lot of clay, there's probably pockets of sand somewhere too, which can kind of offset the clay and help it drain. So if you can find like a mix, if you can, if you can find like a mix somehow, like if you can like use your clay, mix some sand in with it and then use rock as your base, it's going to be a lot more work than what I'm doing right now, but you can eventually like blend different materials together to build. And that's kind of what I would say. It's going to be a more time consuming process. And I mean, honestly, the only way I can give you a really solid, really good answer is by doing a video tutorial. And I have to find a spot like that to really get, get into it. Um, okay. A few more questions here. Let's see if I missed anything. Um, have you gone riding in the Kootenays, Retallic, Nelson, Caslow, or Kazlgar? Yeah, I've been to Retallic and Nelson once, both places in the same trip. I went to go visit like Kurt Sorge and uh, Garrett Bueller rode a bunch of other zones. Those guys ride a lot, and that was so fun. That was just for the day, though. Or maybe like two, we had two days of riding in total. But yeah, I need to get back there. That place is unreal. Send it Puerto Rico keeps asking me if we want to ride together. I mean, dude, I want to ride Puerto Rico one day. So, I mean, your best bet would be to DM me on Instagram and keep messaging me. <laughs> and uh, eventually I'll make it happen. Uh, okay. Let's see here. A few questions that I'm recognizing I've answered already, but we only have four minutes left. So I'm going to see what I have for troubling really questions just on Instagram again, because I've been kind of going back and forth answering for you guys. And um, if you have anything else that I, like if you have a question that I missed and you've asked it a few times, the comments are slowing down right now. So ask it again, please. And I will try to get an answer for you. Um, let's see here. Any trailblazing questions you guys have, please ask me right now. I'm gonna pull up more questions. I don't know why I don't just have it here. Okay. Oh yeah. Here's one I want to answer again, because this is a question a few people have asked. How do you build trails when you don't have much elevation? And how do you create the most speed on a mostly flat, flat plot of land? And I probably got like 10 of those sort of questions. And yeah, they're kind of related, right? You don't have a lot of elevation. You're working in flat land. How do you carry speed? And this is where rollers come into play. Like rollers are the answer to this for you. I mean, it's amazing. Think about a pump track, right? Like a pump track is just a little trail on a flat piece of land that goes in a loop. And think about a pump track when you're thinking about working with little elevation. And if you're working with little elevation and little dirt and it's really rough terrain, then that's when stuff gets like super tough. But I'm just gonna give you the hardest case scenario possible as an example to really help anyone who might have a question related to this. Okay, so let's put in this imaginary scenario. I'm working with a really flat trail it's really rocky. There's not a lot of good dirt and it's not a lot of elevation. So I want it to be longer. I would, first thing I would do is look for all the rocks I could find that I could use to help me shape a berm and a roller. And I would almost like mark out a line first from top to bottom with as many turns as possible. And anywhere where it feels like, okay, I'm going to lose speed here because it's going flat or slightly uphill. I would like make a marker. Okay. I'm going to put a roller here. And then I would work with that as a base. And then I would go in, I would kind of find some rocks to get me started. And then I would go in and I would use whatever dirt I have to do the final shaping. And I would decide, I'm, okay, I'm putting like rollers in these longer, flatter bits to help me carry speed. And rollers are your key, like, and really space them out nicely. Like that's something you're gonna learn of time and practice. <clears throat> Make them bigger than you think always. And then if they're not giving you enough pump, and then shave them shorter and steeper afterwards with the same amount of material. Someone's asking what the best dirt to use is. I like a really nice like clay sand mix. Like here in the forest, when you get, get like a foot or two down in the dirt, it gets into that really rich like red ready soil and it's got sand mixed in with it. That stuff is the very best. 
What angle lip would you recommend for around a 20 footer? I'm guessing Colton, you're saying a 20 foot gap jump. I mean, it really depends on your run in and what kind of terrain you're working with. But just as a general answer, like, I mean, a lot of the gaps on my line are 20 feet or more, and I'm running like waist high long takeoffs using that same like kind of 12 foot radius shape in gen as like a general guideline. Um, Okay, Franco said I just described his location. Oh man, that sounds brutal to work with, but I hope that helps. And like, I mean, I would be up to do a video in a location like that one day just for the challenge to see like how sick I could make something with like the hardest terrain possible. Um, Thomas is saying I should come to Chile. Dude, I need to get to South America again. That place is awesome. Um, have you been to Duthie Hill? Oh man, that sounds so familiar. Maybe, I don't think so, maybe not. I'm going to do a quick Google search on where that is. <laughs> where is Duffy Hill anyways? Maybe I've been there. I don't know. Is that in Washington? Um, okay. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, it is in Washington. Yeah, I think I might have been there. I don't know. I've rode a couple random spots around Washington, like in like near Seattle and up in Bellingham. Okay, uh, I, we're at 10.01, so I'm a little over time here. I got to get going. Um, just to answer a few more general questions. Yes, my shoulder's heating up. Well, I got full range now. Like, oh, it's still sore and tight to do this. I still got like a bump on my collarbone. I don't think that's ever going away. But I get x-rays tomorrow. That is going to be the final, final thing that I'm going to know about. I scheduled in my first physio for Thursday. So I'm hoping I get the green light for that physio session. And I'm hoping, I mean, man, I think I'm going to start pedaling around just like flat trails like this week. And I'm hopefully going to, I'm going to start building next week, just easy trail building and hopefully riding within two weeks or so. I hope so. Um, all right. Yes. <laughs> face, race, race, face. You get a shout out. So shout out to face, race, race, face. Um, so sick, you're a rider and a builder too. Um, you're welcome, Colton. Thanks for watching through the whole thing. And same with you, Paul. Stoked, man. I'm stoked you sat through this whole thing. Same with you, BM Outdoors. Thanks so much, guys. You guys are awesome. And that is it for this live stream. I'll do more soon. So cheers, guys. And I'll have another video soon to come. Let me know, I promise. <laughs> It's been really challenging to keep the content going while I've been injured. It's been quite a painful break too. Like this hurts more than any other broken bone I've had other than when I like shattered my femur, but I was like pumped up on painkillers for the first few weeks. So that was a bit of a different scenario. So this has been a brutal collarbone break. I don't know why it hurts so much. Like I got surgery on this one. I got surgery on that one a few years ago and it hurt way less than this one. So I don't know why, but hopefully I'm riding soon. Thanks again, guys. Cheers, everyone. And cheers from around the world, and I'll see you soon. All right, peace out.